tonight, okay? But it's a little tongue in cheek. The title of what I'm going to read from you comes from a book called Songs in the Night, okay? So it's a little bit of, of, of that. But uh, in all seriousness, J. Danson Smith, I don't know if you ever heard him. I've quoted him before. He used to, on occasion, go to the Moody Memorial Church, and he had a Bible verse. He would read the Bible verse, and then he would read a poem. He has the book of poems. And so I'm going to read from that. It comes from Songs in the Night, uh, and it talks about the unending goodness of God. So he takes a particular verse. Uh, from Deuteronomy, and he writes this poem based on it, and he says, These simple thoughts perhaps are worthy of repeating. They may give strength on life's eventful road. Years come and go, and time keeps onward fleeting. How good to have the soul stayed calm in our Lord. How good to muse in happy, sweet reflection over all the way by which his hand has led us. How strengthening and rich the recollection of all his goodness in the years now fled. He will not fail. His word cannot be broken. He gave his best. Shall he not else give? No need to ask for a sign, a sense, or a token, or anything, but simply to trust his word and to live with him. So that's what we're doing tonight. So take your Bibles and your handouts, and let's turn to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, and this will be the third and final part, Lord willing, because if not, uh, I don't know what else we'll do, because that's all I have planned. Okay, But uh, in all seriousness, this is part three, so the third and final part of our study of the Noahic covenant. If you don't have a handout, I had to make some extras, so there are some down there if you need one. Um, and uh, so you're more than welcome to take one. I'm going to refer to it. Of course, it's just an outline to kind of keep us on track. But what we'll do tonight is I will review the handout, which will include a review of part one and part two. In other words, part one and part two of our study. And then we're going to conclude the study by looking at the last of the contents of the Noahic covenant. And then lastly, we'll look at the sign of the covenant. A lot of times God gives signs related to the covenants that he gives as a way to remember them or to recall to mind the covenants. And we'll look at what the sign is related to this covenant. And quite frankly, that's probably the thing most people remember about the Noahic covenant, less the contents, but probably more the sign. But that's actually what God's intent was. His intent was that a sign would remind you of, in this case, his covenant. Uh, if you have the handout, uh, I'll just kind of review it a little bit, and then we'll cover uh, what would be part one and part two, meaning of the the studies that we have. So if you have the handout, uh, essentially what it gives is an, the outline there, Roman numeral 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we started off with looking at the introduction, which was sort of a summary of when does and when was the Noahic covenant given. So the way I approached it was, if you recall, Genesis 1 through 8, God created, sin comes into the world, and then there's this quick deterioration, and then eventually God brings judgment upon the earth via the flood. And the flood uh, is God's means of judging and bringing judgment, and the only that survived would be Noah and his family, as we've already looked at. But the interesting thing is, I mentioned er early on in the study, is that God promises to give the covenant before the flood starts, if you recall, when we studied part one, it's a, it's, a, it's a mention of it. He says, in effect, I'm going to establish a covenant with you, which implies they're going to not only survive whatever this judgment is, this flood judgment. And by, what, by that, I mean, there had never been a worldwide flood, so he would not have had a full concept of it at the time. But in any case, God promised to give the covenant. And the idea there is that God would start over again. Okay, so God's going to judge the entire earth and then God would start over again once the flood subsides and those sorts of things. Now, if you look at Roman numeral two, so when we looked at part one, we looked at the introduction and I gave the basic information on the Noahic uh, covenant. So 
what is a covenant? And if you remember, I use the idea of a promise just because I think that's an easy way to think of it. Uh, so, for example, it would be a covenant. We'll think of it this way, a promise between two parties. OK, I promise to do this. Now, if it's if you remember conditional, it would be me saying, I promise to do this if Gene does this. That would be the idea of a conditional covenant. An unconditional one is the one we're looking at, which is the Noahic one, which is God says, I'm going to do this, period. And the difference between the two is both come from God, but one of those is based on God and his character. And that's what we're looking at here. The Noahic covenant has no, I don't like to use the phrase, but no strings attached. There's no requirements for God to bring these promises about. So that's what the idea there is, if you notice in the handout of unconditional. So a covenant would be a promise between, we think of two parties, but sometimes in the Bible there are conditions attached. That would be, I think of the, um, no, I'm sorry, the Davidic covenant, for instance, would be one. Uh, but in this case, it's unconditional and it's also universal. Now, if you say, what is that? Remind me of that. So if you take the Davidic covenant, who was and who are those promises geared towards? Well, the nation of Israel, you could say in short. Those are the promises of the uh, descendants of King David. So that takes us to that God was going to bring a flood to judge the earth. He's going to start over with Abra uh, sorry, Noah, a covenant we think of as a promise between two parties. The difference is that some have conditions attached, some don't. And in this case, it's universal. Now, if you look at the Roman numeral three, we've covered A through D. So that would be four of the five parts of the contents. So if we look at those, the first one was to fill the earth. If you remember, Noah is told essentially the same general thing as whom? Does anybody remember? God had promised, or had, I'm sorry, had asked some other person prior to Noah to be fruitful and multiply. Adam and, yep, so you remember that? Genesis, we talked about Genesis 128, very similar type promise. God's desire was, of course, the earth would be full, okay? Then the next one is rule over the animal realm. So there was this need to have dominion, over the animal realm. Now we have a family dog. His name is Oscar. And he wanted me to remind everyone that that means not to mistreat the animals, but to be a good steward. You remember that does not give us the authority to mistreat animals it is that we exercise stewardship. And we think of stewardship typically as money. And that's not always the case. That is the case, but that's not always the case. Stewardship would be the building. If you think of our building here, we should be good stewards of our building. Uh, God has given us animals, and as my and our dog says, Oscar, we are to be good stewards by taking good care of them, not to mistreat them. Three, there's a change in diet. How many people are glad for this one? You go from eating green leaves and a vegetarian diet so that Charlie can go have steak with his son on Sunday afternoons. Amen? So that's Genesis 129. If you remember, Adam was told, eat of the, if you will, and be vegetarian. But then we looked at the last one, and the last one is the one that we looked at last time, which is D on your handout, which is capital punishment. Now, I'm not going to go back over that because I spent so much time on it. I do have one more of the Ryrie articles on capital punishment if you're interested in it. But the main thing to remember with that is God was trying to show the, if you will, value of human life. God said that animals and humans, but in particular with capital punishment, uh, or as some of you like to call it, justice, <laughs> depends on how you look at it, um, that was to show the value of human life. Now, does all life have value or just certain ones? Oh, right, and so again, that is the basis for that idea there, capital punishment. Now, if you look at the handout, what we're going to look at tonight is no more, pay attention to the wording there, global floods. I'll touch on that a little bit. And uh, then we'll look at the sign of the covenant, and then we'll wrap up. So we have covered in Genesis 9, 
verses 1 through 7, which is what those contents describe. But I want someone to read, if someone would, verses 8 through 17 of Genesis 9 for me. Um, And then that'll take us to the end of what describes the Noahic covenant. So would someone read Genesis 9, 8 through 17? Probably Gene, I'm guessing. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that comes out of the earth, even every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never be cut off by the water of the flood, neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant, which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all suggestive generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow will be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. All right, thank you, Gene. All right, so if we look at this last part here, this so this would be eight through 17 and verses one through seven, you essentially have those contents of the covenant, the first four that we looked at. Uh, of course, that's a natural break there. So fill the earth, rule over the animal realm. Uh, and a dominion type of mentality there. The change in food, so steak is appropriate at this point, uh, capital punishment, and I, I mentioned again the idea of the value of human life. But here, when we look at verses 8 through 17, but in particular 8 through 11, when Gene was reading it, so God, of course, is the one speaking. So God is taking the initiative and the prerogative here to establish this with the only living humans at this time. And so the last part of the contents is the promise not to flood the earth. And I say it this way, in the same way again, okay? Uh, we don't want to come away with, and I, and I know sometimes we don't want to split hair sometimes, but it's we need to be clear here because there are people that would say, well, God says, you know, no, God says, I won't judge in the same way or the same manner. Uh, As Gene was reading through this, you can see that's what God's intent is. Uh, For example, verse 15, I'm just randomly choosing this one. It's, It's repeated, but in verse 15 at the end, notice, and never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. So the idea here is that God is making this promise that that means of judgment will not happen again. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard someone say, okay, so I got that, and so that means God's never going to judge the earth again. (laughs) There's such thing as called fire in the New Testament that God would judge in a cataclysmic way. I don't know if you ever thought about it this way. If you were to read Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 18, there's a lot of fire, isn't there? There's a lot of other forms of judgment. So the idea here is that the last part is that there would not be this, if you will, universal cataclysmic flood again. And this is made with not only Noah, but all of his descendants. Now, do you know any descendants of Noah? Yeah, we are. Amen. So, right. So what is that? That's a universal promise, right? Right. Not that there wouldn't be local floods. We know that is the case, and we should not make light of them because people die from them and those sorts of things. But God, of course, is saying that universally, I'm not going to come back and I'm going to destroy the earth through that means. He's got another way he's going to do it, which is, of course, the judgments we see in Revelation. Uh, I don't know if you ever had someone ask you, I mean, why would we even have floods to begin with locally? Tell you an easy answer for that is it's in Romans where it says not only does not only do humans and their bodies long to be redeemed and restored. I mean, do you not look forward to a time when you'll have the eternal body? Not only will those pops and cracks be gone, 
and all the wrinkles that you try to get rid of. But actually, there's one that I think overrides all of it, which is you won't have a sin nature. I, don't ask me what that would be like, because I don't know. So just remember this piece of it. Now, of course, the question would be, okay, so what's the big deal? Why is this so important? The reason why this is important, one of the reasons is because the fulfillment of the promises God has made are not dependent on humans. In other words, the promise is not based off of what you and I do or don't do. And this should be encouraging to us because there are some promises that God gives that have the stipulations, but this isn't one of them. Okay, And the point is they're simply based on and will be fulfilled because God is good to his word. Because God says that he's going to do it, because God says he will do something, he will keep his word and it will make sure that it gets fulfilled. So again, this does not negate a local flood. But again, the idea there is, and I'm going to point these out to you one more time because I know that there are critics that use this passage, and it's an easy one to refute. Notice in verse 11, the point of this promise is not to destroy the earth by water. Again, verse 11, verse 15, and God is making it with all of humanity that we never have to worry about this type of judgment again. Now, I want us to look at a particular verse, and it's in Psalm 105, and it's there's a couple of reasons why I chose this one, but this one speaks of how God remembers. This is Psalm 105, verse 8. It speaks of how God remembers, and if you get confused with that, it's not as though God says, oh, I forgot. It is the idea of reckoning or recalling to mind to something. But in Psalm 105, verse 8, I want someone to read this in just a moment and maybe include verse 9 so you don't get confused. This is related to the next covenant in sequence, which is the Abrahamic one, okay? But the idea of this verse, I think, will help you remember. God will remember. In other words, he's going to recall to mind, I made this promise and these promises, and when I make a promise, they're forever. And you can bank on those to be fulfilled. But would someone read verse, go ahead and include verse 9. Uh, I'll do it. 8 and 9? Yes, ma'am. He has remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham, and his oath to Isaac. All right, so when we look at that there in verse 8, it says he remembered. Again, that isn't the idea, so don't get confused. God doesn't forget anything, okay? Two ways to think of this. I don't know if this helps any. If it doesn't, you know, you can hit the rewind button and delete this from your thinking. God is speaking in language so that we can understand it, okay? Have you ever, and I use this as a loose analogy, have you ever been reading the Bible and you know something and you go, oh yeah, yep, I remember that. You had it there. It's not as though you forgot it or didn't know it. It's just you're sort of recalling it to mind, okay? The reverse of this works too. Do you know that God doesn't remember your sins when you trust in Jesus Christ? You stand before him. He doesn't recall those and bring those before you. So that's just one way to think of it. But sometimes when God's speaking or using this, is trying to explain things in language we can understand. God doesn't forget anything. He knows every single thing that you've ever done, for better or for worse. But when we trust in Christ, he doesn't recall those and bring those before us if we've trusted in Christ. Now, if we go back here to Genesis 9, uh, we're going to move on in just a second, having covered the contents. But I want you to think about this. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. Could you imagine leaving the ark? And at some point in time in the future, not a drizzle, but a bad storm comes. Wouldn't you want to know? Not again, Lord, that, that you're not going to bring this judgment. What graciousness that God would include that as part of it. He could have, in other words, just simply said, oh, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore. I just won't tell them. But imagine a storm coming, not a drizzle. Your first thing was, I would be scared. But we would remember that God's promises are supposed to comfort us, aren't they? The promises of God comfort us because he keeps his word. 
And when God says he's going to do something, he keeps his word. So we've covered the contents. If you look on the handout, the contents of the covenant are that the population would fill the earth. So the descendants of Noah, they would rule over the animal realm, perhaps in a, I believe in a slightly different manner than what they would have before. I'll be being good stewards. There's a change in diet. In other words, food, meat becomes permissible as long as they do what? Can't eat the blood because the blood indicates life, right? And again, the point with the uh, Noahic covenant is to remind us of the value of human life, which leads us into capital punishment, but then no more global floods. Now, how would you and I need to remember it? Well, God not only has recorded it here, obviously, but how does God or does God give anything so that when we visually see it, we can go, you know what? I remember what that means. When we observe communion, what are we remembering? And they're sort of visual, we might say. It's the same thing here with this covenant, because God's going to give a sign of the Noahic covenant, and the sign is something you and I can look forward to. You're driving down the road one day, and you see this. You can remember what it means, and what it means is, is that God keeps his word. Okay. So let's look here at this. This is um, so we've looked at verses eight through eleven. So if we look at the rest, verse twelve, notice uh, and again, this is when Jean was reading it. God is the one speaking. God is taking the prerogative, the initiative, and He's saying, in effect, "I've made this covenant. Here's the contents of it, and I'm going to. This is my word. Seal it. I'm going to have a way for you to remember." that I keep my word and those things. Notice what he says. So God says, this is the sign of the covenant which I'm making between you, uh, excuse me, between me and you and every living creature for all successive generations. And what is the sign? And you'll notice it's a bow. Okay. This is kind of interesting. Um, a little bit of a word play here, I suppose. There's a Hebrew word, if you want to look it up, it's Q-E-S-E-T. That's the, tran- the transliteration of it. Do you know what it actually means? I wouldn't expect you to off the top of your head. It means a battle bow. Do you know what a battle bow would look like? It has that arc on it. That's the same word that is used here as this battle bow. So you imagine a bow and you pull it back and the bow has a what on it? It has an arc not to be confused with the Ark of the Covenant or any or the Ark of what we're talking about here, but it has this Ark here. And what it would do is it would remind us when we see this Ark in the sky, this bow, that God keeps his promises. But how long is it for? I mean, is it for a temporary period of time? Look at verse 16. When this bow is in the cloud, so we know the bow is going to be an ark, and it's going to be in the clouds and in the sky, in other words, the atmosphere. Then I will will look upon it, and I will remember, I will recall to mind the everlasting covenant. So God makes this covenant, and it is forever. Okay? We never have to worry about some sort of expiration date on it and that God would do this. Now, one question that comes up with this, and I wasn't there, so I have no way to know this, and so neither was anyone else, but you may have this in a study Bible, which is were there, was we would call them rainbows before the flood, or were they part of the atmospherical changes? And of course, nobody knows because nobody was there. Okay, so what you might end up with is, and I'm going to explain the two for you, and then I'm going to read you a quote. So in other words, what you'll end up with is two theories here, okay? That they could have existed before, or because of all of the atmospherical changes, and you know, the, the, the world did have a quite a cataclysmic change, that then the rainbows or the bows became in existence after the flood. Following me? So if it was before the flood, it's possible. Or was it because there was all these atmospherical changes? Well, if it was post-flood, what someone would be saying is the conditions on the earth changed and those conditions made it where those arcs or those bows existed. Well, if it existed before the flood, 
what the person would be saying is it now has a new meaning, okay? So let me explain it to you this way. If, I'm not saying which way I go, I'm trying to explain to you the two options. If rainbows existed before the flood, and there are some people that believe that, that what God is doing is he's giving it a new meaning or a new purpose, okay? Second option is to say, no, I don't believe that. I think because of all the atmospherical changes and all the changes to creation, those bows began to exist post-flood, okay? Let me read you this, and it's actually on your handout, and I'm going to show you where there's a difference uh, of viewpoint. It doesn't really... I mean, look, you understand this isn't a salvation issue, okay? There are people who are going to go to heaven who probably believe both. But uh, let's read, if you will, and I have it in the notes here. It's a Ryrie study Bible. Uh, notice how Ryrie writes it. He says, my, and he's inserting here what we call it, rainbow. He says, likely, notice the word, likely a new phenomenon due to the changed atmospheric and cloud conditions after the flood. But the most important thing is what Ryrie includes after it. Notice what he says. It serves as the sign of God's cover, covenant, excuse me, never again to send a universal destructive flood. Okay? So that is what Ryrie's way of saying, I don't know for sure, but what likely could have happened is that the atmosphere and clouds and all those changes enabled for a cloud or a rainbow rather to appear. But the reason why I want you to read that or look at that is notice the point of it. The point's the same either way, okay? The point of the rainbow is to remind you that God keeps his promises and that we can trust God to fulfill those. Do future covenants have signs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the sign of the Abrahamic covenant? All the men say, ouch, mm -hmm. circumcision. Mm -hmm. And so that is a sign of that. When we use communion, what are we doing? It's a visual sign to remind us of what? Well, of course, we have the bread. What does the bread represent? It's his body. It's not his body. It represents, it's a visual of it. And then after we do that, we take the cup, which represents, of course, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're recalling to mind, and you could think of it as a sign uh, for that. I'll give you time for questions in a minute. But what I want us to think of here is when we finish this is this. The Noahic covenant promises, and hear me when I say this, because this is really important. You can know all this information. It won't do you any good. The Noahic covenant promises are based upon God's faithfulness alone. Because God is faithful to keep His Word, we know there'll never be a universal flood again, and we know that as a result we can trust all of God's other promises, no matter which ones they are in the Bible. I'm going to finish with reading something, and then I'll give you some time to ask me questions and make sure I've covered everything or clarified it. But one of my favorite authors, C.H. McIntosh, he comes from a era, he's from a long time ago, but I love the way he writes this about the rainbow. He says, I, says God, will remember. How sweet to think of what God will and what he will not remember. He will remember his covenant but he will not remember his people's sins. The cross which ratifies the former puts away the latter. The belief of this gives peace to the troubled and uneasy soul. You understand what he's saying? He's saying that God can choose, in a sense, to recall or bring before us whatever he chooses. And when we trust in Jesus, do you know when you stand before him one day, as we like to say, if you've trusted in him, Jesus has assumed all of your sins for you, and he won't remember them anymore. What a glorious promise that is. And how can we know that it's true, though? Because God keeps his word.